And like I just mentioned, this is our 75th anniversary. On July 1st, 1945, the School of Aeronautics started as a standalone academic unit here at Purdue. In 1960, we, we joined with the Engineering Sciences to become the School of Aeronautics and Engineering Sciences. In 1963, we started what most people refer to as the Astronaut Program, a program to let many uh, United States Air Force Academy cadets and graduates come to Purdue to get their master's degree. Many of those went on to be astronauts for NASA. Because of that program, in 1965, our name changed to the School of Aeronautics, Astronautics, and Engineering Sciences. In 1967, if we have some alumni and faculty joining in, you might remember where we were in Grissom Hall. We moved there in 1967. In 1973, our name changed to its current name, the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. In 1966, we started the first Purdue Fall Space Day, which a lot of our students and alumni have participated in for many years, one of our larger outreach programs here at Purdue. In 2007, we moved to the new building, the Neil Armstrong Hall of Engineering, where I'm sitting in today. And I wish you could all be with us in a large lecture hall, but given the current circumstances, we're doing this all virtual. So I'm speaking to you from my office here. Uh, Purdue Aeronautics and Astronautics, our school has had a great tradition. Purdue, you know, most people know, has had 25 astronauts. 16 of them have got their degrees or a degree from aeronautics and astronautics. We have one of the largest alumni bases of aerospace engineers in the world. We have more than 11,000 degrees that the school has given to our alumni. Over the 75 years, we've grown and grown. This year, in fall of 2020, we have an all-time record enrollment. We have 1,548 students. 960 of those are, are undergraduate students, and 588 of those are graduate students. And our, like our name says, aeronautics and astronautics, we're strong in both aeronautics and astronautics parts of aerospace engineering. We consistently appear in, in the top 10 of national rankings of aerospace engineering programs. And so what we wanted to do for part of our celebration was to make sure we featured both aeronautics and astronautics. So today, I'm really fortunate to have Eric Stalmer as our, our lecturer today. Eric is the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. That's the largest organization that promotes commercial space flight. Um, the CSF has been involved in many policy decisions, including working on the Commercial Space Launch Act, which is one of the important pieces to open up commercial space flight as an industry. And the CSF works to develop standards. They encourage further growth in the industry. And they certainly work on commercial space flight as, as a place to spur the national economy and create high-tech jobs and high-tech growth in, in the United States. Because of that role, Eric's got a very big picture view of commercial space flight, which makes him really incredibly well suited to give today's talk, to give us an overview of that. Uh, Eric's done a lot of different things, including being on the National Space Council User Advisory Group. He also serves as co-chair of the Federal Aviation Administration's Aviation Rulemaking Committee, where they work a lot on space launch, re-entry uh, ARCs or aviation rulemaking committees, and the Spaceport Aviation Rulemaking Committee. So Eric's been very instrumental in those pieces of the puzzle for commercial space flight as well. Uh, Eric got his Master of Arts in Public Administration from George Mason and has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and History from Mount St. Mary College. And in the little chat before we got started, while Eric's not a Purdue alum, I, I know he's a huge Purdue supporter. So with that, let me go ahead and introduce Eric. Eric, welcome to Purdue virtually, and we're pleased to have you as our speaker for the 75th anniversary talk in astronautics. Bill, can you uh, see me and hear me all right? I can see you and I can hear you. Ah, that's twice as good. It's the, the first time I've ever used one of these webinars in the last seven months. Um, <laughs> no, that's a, a stab at humor there. Uh, no, Bill, I really want to thank you um, for having me today. I want to also thank uh, Dr. Calicut, Dr. Stephen Calicut, uh, who's also a very good friend. Um, uh, certainly to Purdue as a, a professor there, but also to the commercial space flight industry and what um, Dr. Calicut does with um, with our, our suborbital researchers group uh, that um, is part of CSF and, and has been a very, very active part of CSF. Um, I was delighted to, to come here and speak to you guys today because Purdue has meant so much to me. As, as I, I was saying to you earlier, uh, though I don't have a degree, maybe after this talk, I'll get an honorary one. I'm not sure uh, how that works. 
Um, but uh, what I've realized, um, not a day goes, very few days goes by in my professional career um, that it's not touched in some way uh, by a Purdue alum. And, uh, and I can extrapolate on that a little bit. And it goes back to the history of, of CSF, um, where, where it began and, and who was at the forefront of that. Uh, recently, and as I, as I say about uh, being touched by, you know, or knowing Purdue um, alumni all over, for the longest time, uh, we had um, two employees that were Purdue graduates, and they always had uh, the poster of, of the cradle of astronauts. Uh, and I, I think theirs was at a date because I think they had 23 or 24. Um, but was, what was nice for me was that I knew um, many of those astronauts, you know, the Charlie Walkers and the Gary Paytons and uh, Mike McCauley uh, and Mark Pulaski. Um, but I'm not gonna focus today on that. Uh, you know, that is a rich part of uh, Purdue's history that really I think has, has built the foundation for what we are doing today in commercial space. Uh, with, you know, uh, back when CSF started in 2006, I think one of the early employees was a Purdue graduate, John Gedmark, uh, who he has gone on to start a company called Astronis, and they're doing really well, a small sat company. And what John did was hired um, a lot of Purdue interns uh, and, then, and then made them employees. So the Purdue network, uh, the Purdue mafia, as you will, ha is rich. Uh, in the in the annals of, of the C CSF employees, um, but I would say when I say mafia, it's a very ben benevolent mafia um, that uh, that they're giving, uh, they give back, they're caring, but most importantly, they're very very intelligent uh, engineers. So with that, I want to um, talk a little bit about my background, what got me to CSF. Um, where CSF, you know, the past few years at CSF, and then what we have um, going on in the future, what, you know, what we have in store um, and how that's gonna be impacted by Purdue engineers, and Purdue graduates. So as, as you pointed out, Bill, I am not uh, an engineer. Um, and when you're not an engineer, you try to make up for that. So I, so I sometimes say that I'm a scientist, although uh, that would only be a political scientist. Um, which is, you know, a third rung uh, on that scale. But I think that's important, you know, here in Washington, uh, especially if we want to do what it says behind me uh, in dram dramatically democratizing access to space. And that takes policy changes to do that. So my background, I came from the Army. I did ROTC. Uh, when I left, uh, got off of active duty, uh, I came to Washington, I worked on the Hill, uh, worked, uh, started working national missile defense issues, and then I took a job with an organization called Space Transportation Association, where I really learned a great deal about the launch side of the house, and especially the policies that, um, and the implications that those policies had. And then I went to this fantastic company that is the home to many, many Purdue engineers uh, called Analytical Graphics, AGI. And I hope I hope that uh, all you, you students out there that are listening have the, this software on your desktop because it really, uh, if you're an aerospace engineer, that this software is what, what Microsoft Office would be to us lay people. Um, and my mentor and closest friend, Travis Langster, also a Purdue um, alum. And you know he really showed me the ropes and we worked very, very closely together for, for almost 15 years um, changing the, the way the industry looks uh, at commercial, at utilizing commercial assets, uh, commercial off-the-shelf products in the case of AGI. And then about six years ago, almost uh, six years ago in two weeks, um, I began at CSF. And uh, it was a very challenging transition because I had replaced an astronaut. And as, uh, as you can imagine, I am not an astronaut. And, and not just an astronaut, not even a Purdue astronaut. He, he came from the other school that produces astronauts in um, uh, Annapolis. So um, it, was, it was challenging at first. And, you know, we had to figure out why CSF, you know, for me, why CSX, CSF existed. What can we do differently that other organizations couldn't do? And I, just to get back a little bit about the history of CSF and why 
back in 2006, it was, it was created. I think you'll find it interesting that there was a company, you know, many know you know, of now um, called SpaceX. And I was part of these uh, industry roundtables, and it was run by a very, very large trade association. And uh, at these roundtables, it had all the big guys at the table. It had Lockheed and Boeing and Northrop and Raytheon and, and everyone you can think of. Um, and they would go around the room and say, hey, does anyone have any questions, any issues? And, and the, the gentleman from SpaceX would raise his hand and say, yeah, yeah, we, we have some issues. You know, I, I don't think we've been included on this. And they literally would look the other way not even take their 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 questions and uh and i as i often joke with the, my spacex friends i mean they were literally put at the the, the kids table right, that you would have at thanksgiving and I, and it was there that if this got back to elon and he said you know we need our own trade association and and that's where um csf was born out of that elon and other young space entrepreneurs that you know want to build you know, launch vehicles wanted to put people into space, didn't feel that they had that access to do so. Um, and they knew that there was challenges in Washington. It started off with 10 or 12 companies, and now we are up to 90 uh, different organizations that, that we represent. So, and then through that time, there was a lot of fights because, again, it was disruptive. Commercial has always been disruptive to um, people that that have that, that access and have those contracts. So I think we're one of the first fights that CSF had was back, and again, this is before my time, but back in about 2010 or 2012 with the commercial cargo contracts to the International Space Station and the uh, commercial crew contract. And how that all came about, all the different companies that were bidding on it, and the resistance that it got from their traditional players that did not want really to see this, this cost, um, I'm sorry, not cost plus, a fixed price contract. You know, they were much more comfortable and much more custom to cost plus contracts where the, the cost obviously increases um, with the, um, as the, the mission and the, the uh, contract increases. So it's, it's a much more lucrative um, aspect. So that gets us to what does CSF do? In the simplest terms, we are here to promote and protect the commercial space industry. Promote it, that's become a, an easier job these days because, pardon the pun, but it's really taken off. Um, so much is going on in our industry. There's so much excitement uh, on all levels. And, and who are we protecting? It's really the entire ecosystem of the commercial space industry. And that starts from the ground up. It starts from companies um, that are building spaceports and the spaceports themselves and the launch vehicles and the payloads that are going on the launch vehicles and those propulsion systems, those innovative propulsion systems that are being developed. And then the work that's happening on the International Space Station and the exploration missions and these affordable exploration missions that are presenting itself. So it all goes all the way out to Pluto. You know, we are one of our uh, board members led the, the New Horizon mission um, for Pluto a few years back. So as I kind of jotted down my notes, I was looking back at, you know, so you have a little bit of the basis of where CSF came from. And then where, when I started and where I fit in, my first you know, month on the job was uh, October of 2014. Um, many probably don't realize that it was probably one of the worst months for commercial space. Uh, one, in, in, in the course of a week, there was an accident uh, down in, um, or a launch anomaly down at um, uh, Wallops Island at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, Mars, uh, where the, the vehicle, the, the Antares vehicle just blew up right off on the pad um, and really destroyed the launch pad. And then two or three days later, it was a tragic accident that Virgin Galactic had on one of their test flights and scaled composites, um, all of our companies. So that was the kind of the time, the industry that I kind of walked into 
that there was, we were suffering setbacks. And a few months later, SpaceX had a, a setback with their Falcon 9 uh, vehicle. So to be advocating for policies on doing more and more with commercial was a difficult and, and challenging undertaking at times, going up to Congress and saying, you need to you know, depend more on the commercial industry. Uh, and there, there was a great deal of skepticism. <clears throat> and skepticism, I should say, in Congress usually um, comes to light for parochial reasons, uh, and, and thus, I mean, jobs. And if you are not doing jobs in, in that district, uh, the, the level of um, skepticism tends to grow higher and higher. So that is always, uh, has, has been a challenge, and it's not just for, for commercial space, but I think for everyone, it, it's, it's a challenge. So we weren't deterred by the, those setbacks, and, and we gradually had more and more steps forward as opposed to you know steps backwards uh and as bill had mentioned one of the the big um milestones that i think we'd had that we had and that really put us on the map was we you know asked members of congress to introduce um uh, amendments and elements to update the commercial space launch act of 1984. that that was that's kind of the holy grail uh, of the commercial space industry that this bill that was introduced gosh, uh, almost 40 years ago. And every, uh, every five or six years, they add amendments to it to update the bill. Um, and this one was a really big year. And what we were able to do was really help shape and, and kind of do a formation of what the commercial space industry should look like. Uh, and so that bill, you know, had to go through the House, uh, the House Science Committee, where you know, the Republicans controlled that, and then the, the Senate Commerce Committee at the time was controlled by the Democrats. And to try to get a bipartisan bill through and onto the president's desk, um, it doesn't happen very often in Washington, unfortunately. <clears throat> and as of lately, it hardly ever happens. So I think that year, there was only 272 pieces of legislation passed not including naming of post offices and such. And that was regarded as one of the, the, the truly landmark um, and biggest victories in, in legislation that there was. And it really you know, helped so many space companies um, uh, with clarity, with a, a vision on what they can expect. Because I think uh, for entrepreneurs, there's nothing more important than stability and predictability. Um, and this bill kind of brought all that to light. So that was a that was a big deal for us, but that you know we couldn't rest on that. There was other issues that you know were going to present itself, uh, and I'll just kind of highlight some of the the interesting lobbying fights that we had. Um, fights might be a strong word, maybe um, disagreement is one, but in the day of the life of what you do here at CSF, one of the issues was um, the excess ballistic missiles that the United States, United States Air Force has in their fleet. You know, as you can imagine, we have thousands of, of um, ballistic missiles. Fortunately, use these missiles, um, but they go bad after a certain amount of time, and, and they need to be um, uh, updated and and replaced. And so, uh, an entrepreneurial company that uh, that you know builds, uh, develops, and builds those those uh, ICBMs said, "Hey, I tell you what, we'll take this off your hands." We'll take these old ICBMs and we'll convert we'll convert them to, uh, to launch vehicles, and it seems like a great idea. Uh, it seems like a very uh, environmentally friendly idea. However, you have this burgeoning industry. You have the government that's going out there and saying to entrepreneurs, "Hey, we need your help. You need to develop this commercial launch industry." And so investors put their money, and and um, uh, um, engineers, you know, you know, entrepreneurs all start building these. These launch companies now knowing that they have to compete with the federal government on assets that were already paid for and then that one company will profit from. So, and in fact, the interesting thing was that that, that company was once a small company and fought the same exact fight 25 years earlier when, um, when someone wanted to convert the old um, Trident uh, missiles from the submarines to, to commercial launch vehicles. So that was a fight that we, we took on with, with some very, very large, uh, up against some very large companies and um, uh, vested interest. Uh, and we came out on top. And
And so that was a uh, that was a positive. Another one was extending the life of the International Space Station and justifying to members of Congress why we're making this investment every year, uh, sometimes to the tune of $4 billion to do work on the International Space Station. This was not an easy argument to, to make at the time. It was for us, but to, to be heard, especially at a time when we did not have access to the International Space Station, that we had to pay the Russians uh, upwards of $85, uh, $87 million Per seat every time we wanted to go to the space station. And so to only have two, sometimes three Americans on board the space station doing this research, we weren't getting as much bang for, for our buck as we were putting into it. But we saw that the science was good, the microgravity research was good, and having that presence, the international stability that the space station brings, um, and the, you know, 20 some odd members that are part of the the, the ISS and, and, and the work that the, the um, U.S. National Lab is doing up there, I think at the end of the day far outweighed the skepticism um, of that. And now that the, now the space station has been extended, uh, authorized to, to continue to at least 2027. So we'll, we'll see what happens, happens there. But also within that fight, we had a, a, you know, to fight for funding for microgravity research. I think microgravity research is one of the most fundamental stepping stones um, in, in building an economy for space and building a, a, a LEO economy. You need this microgravity research um, and, and these platforms that provide it. Sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, these platforms are on suborbital vehicles and, and no one knows more about this topic than uh, Dr. Stephen Collicott, who, uh, as I said earlier, has been um, the head and the lead of our suborbital uh, applications research group. So those were some of the fights, but probably one of the biggest fights that we had came on February 6, 2018. I would ask people to to uh, raise their hand if they know what that date is. I'm sure everyone does. It's a, it's a legendary date in space launch history, but it's the day that the Falcon Heavy launched uh, its maiden flight. And as it did, it had a Tesla, a red, cherry red Tesla sports car on it. So to everyone in the space industry, that was a great day. That was a huge step forward as we saw uh, two of the boosters return back to Earth. Uh, the, the, the payload was successfully launched in a, uh, a far out orbit, um, so it would not to bother anyone. And it was the dawn of this heavy lift reusable vehicle that was um, almost, I won't say completely, but, but by and large uh, financed by the, the um, private sector. Uh, so huge step forward, except, except if you are the airlines. And that was a bad day for the airlines, unbeknownst to us. That lo the launch window for that vehicle was um, about four hour launch window. And, and SpaceX used all of the four hours of that, that launch window to make sure everything uh, went off well. And in doing so, um, caused you know, delays and disruption to the air traffic flow down the Eastern seaboard. And from the airline and the aviation perspective, they said, hey, we understand uh, when you're doing these national security launches, we understand the shuttle launches you know, off the coast uh, and how important this is. But when you have a billionaire, you know, flying his car up into space, that, that's where we draw the line. Because for them, it, it really came down uh, to profits and, and schedule and cost, I should say. Um, and this began a year long fight that we had with the aviation industry on what they saw as um, space lawn, airspace prioritization. And right off the bat, when you say prioritization, it means somebody's first, somebody's second, and, and somebody's third. Um, what we wanted to see right off the bat was airspace integration, because that's going to be critical. As especially, you know, we were only doing you know 16 launches a year down um, on the Florida coast, you know, just a few years back. Now we're you know close to 50 launches a year, and this number's are only going to be growing, and it's not just going to be down in Florida, you're going to have it um, at Wallops Island in Virginia and down in Texas, uh, as well as Spaceport America. And of course, on, on the West Coast ranges in California and, um, 
and Alaska. Uh, we have 10 national spaceports, uh, 10 commercial spaceports in, in this country. So this was a fight, but it was also an educational process of having them understanding radar, the, how space launch works and, and understanding, uh, you know, our sector of business, um, which they really weren't familiar and also them educating us uh, on why they, they do, you know, fly the routes they, they fly and how critical, you know, the, the pushback is for all, all these, um, all these flights. So it's a year long educational process where we really got to, you know, do a deep dive into the aviation community and, and their air traffic management programs. And we brought them to down to see a launch down at, at the Cape and on one day, um, a Falcon 9 launched and the following day an Atlas launched. So they saw, you know, this, this operational cadence that was having, but also they learned, hey, you, you, you can't just launch, um, uh, you know, a Sunday night at 11 o'clock when it, it's not crowded. I, I think some of you engineers would understand the orbital mechanics and orbital uh, dynamics of that. So we, we managed to come together with a report in, in this aviation rulemaking committee that accepted that, you know, hey, we have a, a finite amount of airspace. How are we going to maximize this? What kind of tools are we going to integrate? How are we going to fund this? And on a lot of these issues, especially with like the air, air pilot, airline pilots association, ALPA, and some of the other aviation groups, we saw eye to eye on many of these issues. And it was, um, it was really quite gratifying. So that was the, the arcs. Um, and now I want to get into, before we start the Q and A, and I apologize, I've got a scratchy nose. Um, I want to get into a little bit about the current state of affairs as of the last, you know, few years with space policy and, and how much space policy has, has been impacted and, and what this means, um, for the commercial space industry, but you know, the, the, the space industry writ large, as many, of you know, um, on June 30th of uh, 2017, the president signed an executive order to reestablish the National Space Council. And this Space Council was chaired, uh, is chaired by Vice President Pence. Uh, within the Space Council, they also, this and the Space Council has the, the key cabinet um, post cabinet secretaries representing it, state, defense, commerce, uh, transportation, homeland security, national intelligence, uh, OMB, uh, Department of Energy, and I'm sure I'm leaving out a few others. But everyone's at the table, everyone that has a vested interest um, in space. And what they also did was created this um, users advisory group, basically uh, an industry advisory group to help the Space Council on some of these issues that, that they're, um, they're being, uh, that are come on their plate and be faced with. And so that, I was named to that um, later that year, and it's, it's been a tremendous honor, and I've been uh, one of the, the committee chair people of um, the Economic Development and Industrial Base uh, Subcommittee uh, on that committee, and you know, trying to, how do we best help out this nation grow a, a low Earth orbit space economy, and, and then beyond. Um, politics aside, this was a huge step forward for the space industry. The fact that, you know, all of us space geeks in Washington, these policy wonks, um, we all feel that space is one of the most important things. But when you, you rack and stack it up with all the other priorities that a president has, unfortunately, uh, and this, you know, this administration has new problems, but I mean, unfortunately, space never really made the top 10 uh, list of national priorities. Here with this creation of the National Space Policy, we really felt um, that space had a voice within the administration uh, and they, they really appointed some excellent people to the Space Council uh, led by Dr. Scott Pace from the George Washington uh, University, who's the director of the Space Policy Institute. So really a, an expert on, on space policy. And they listened and they listened to industry quite a bit. So within the, the last I'm trying to think when it, it all kind of went down, but I think the first space policy directive happened in uh, December of 2017. And, and that, that first space policy directive was basically the president signed uh, a change to the national space policy that provides for US led integrated program 
um, with, with private sector partners that would lead, you know, human return to the moon. You know, we all know this now as the Artemis program, uh, getting um, humans back to the moon uh, by 2024 uh, and returning them. Uh, Minister Br Administrator Brian Stein has said a number of times, you know, that we will have the first woman, uh, the first woman and the, the next man on the moon by 2024. Very ambitious goal. Um, but I think, you know, uh, many companies and certainly many of uh, the commercial companies we represent are playing a major role uh, in building uh, the spacecraft and the landers uh, to get us back there. Uh, just yes, I think it was yesterday, just yesterday, um, NASA announced that they were going to, you know, uh, pay companies to extract lunar resources and bring them back to Earth. This has a big impact for a lot of companies that are building uh, these these vehicles that can go to the the, uh, the moon and extract resources, or you know, convert the, the existing resources on the on the moon to uh, fuel or water or whatever it may be. Um, and the fact that NASA will be paying them that's a step forward. Uh, NASA is actively engaging so many of their inter, um, uh, international partners, uh, and so that's been a great thing. Uh, the other. Space policy directives that have had a, a, a very a big impact on uh, on CSF and that we've advocated uh, at the national level for was streamlining the the regulations on the commercial use of space. Uh, the the regulations to launch um, for space launch that are you know are guided by the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation are enormous. And they are outdated. They they don't. They were written back in the 1990s when the vehicles that we have today didn't even exist. They weren't even thought about. Um, so we've been working very closely with the the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation on rewriting and, and streamlining these regulations on launch and reentry. This has been about a year and a half um, project uh, working with the FAA, and it's, this is something that takes usually five years. We're in anticipating. That they're going to release these new um, launch and reentry uh, rules in the next uh, in next week or two, I, I think, is the timeline that they're looking to do. Um, and, and we've seen this done also, the streamlining it with the remote sensing policy uh, that over at NOAA, you know, in the Department of Commerce, uh, that they just had an NPRM a, a notice of proposed rulemaking uh, that they they finished, um, and now they're working on streamlining those rules. Uh, the third. The third um, space policy directive was space traffic management uh, policy, you know, to have a clear, concise policy on who is going to manage uh, space traffic, uh, which is a very, very big deal when you talk about orbital debris and the over 20,000 pieces of um, space junk that is out there. Uh, and then one of the things that that policy said was to do a study to, you know, um, uh, and actually Congress said, you know, what is the best agency to do this? And they just completed a study called the NAPA study, not the nothing to do with the wine, but more um, the National Association, National Academy of Public Administrators uh, did that study and recommended that commerce was the best agency to lead that whole of government approach to, um, to doing space traffic management and integrating the commercial sector and using commercial tools uh, to, to help do this. The fourth one, a little bit controversial, but not a um, a huge surprise to people that have been working in the, the industry is the establishment of the United States Space Force. Um, and that was, uh, that was very interesting how that was rolled out and, uh, and how that's evolving. And, it, and it's really, um, for, for the students in the audience, this is, and for some of those that, that may go into um, the military uh, after graduation, this is an excellent opportunity. Um, Especially from you know getting in a certainly the ground level, um, but to see the, you know the policy shaped at what Space Force is working on, um, and how they're working with other partners within government and outside of government has been has been very impressive. And just the other day, literally I think a week ago, they uh, released um, Space Policy Directive Five, which was cybersecurity um, principles for space systems, and. Um, I haven't delved into that as much as the Intel community has, um, but it, it certainly will have an impact. Um, these are these these space policy directives have really had just a positive impact on the industry, and it, you know, it. Some would say bypasses some legislative processes, 
but by and large, all five of these policies have been uh, generally um, very well supported in Congress um, and by, you know, from the House and Senate on, on both aisles. So that brings us up to, I guess, the last six months of what has been going on and, and, and how and the reason why I am here in Washington rather than being in West Lafayette, where I'd much rather have been today uh, talking to you in person, is COVID and, and what has, the impact it has had on, on the space community, um, on the nation, on our infrastructure, and what we have done, what role you know, CSF has done you know, from a, a DL um, perspective. Uh, right from the get go, you know, we were engaged in this, you know, the, um, the stimulus process uh, on the CARES Act, the HEROES Act, you know, these different um, vehicles that Congress used to help companies, especially contractors, if you're a NASA contractor working on a program that you'd have access to, um, to the facilities that you're working on. Um, we were instrumental working with some of the, the intel agencies and the Department of Defense on streamlining their contracts for many of the, the commercial companies that are working on, um, you know, kind of a bi uh, bilateral, if you will, um, programs that are your dual use, you know, commercial as well as military use um, programs uh, to help them get, you know, just a slightest bit of funding so they could be declared essential businesses. And that enabled, you know, the engineers to go into the office um, and actually bend metal and build rockets and, and do what they do best. And those are things that you cannot do from home. You can do so much, you know, from a computer, but, you know, actually it comes down to building things. You need to be on the premise uh, a lot of times. So that opened up things for a lot of the companies, especially our, our companies out in California um, that, are, that are building uh, next generation vehicles and current vehicles, um, small set manufacturers. And also, you know, looking at funding streams, you know, how these companies got investment money from the um, Paychex Protection Program and, and, and the idea that, you know, companies that are venture backed should, you know, be allowed access to these these funds as much as, you know, startup companies money. Um, and that was a problem. And so we had to work with Treasury and the Small Business Administration to clarify those rules. Um, it, it's probably been one of the busiest times these this past seven months um, in the industry on what has been going on and what um, the needs for our companies. But I, I can also say that um, we are seeing just a, a big uptick in productivity now. Um, especially this summer, because people don't know when to turn off and you're doing emails and working, you know, longer hours, uh, just because what else is there to do? Um, and, and we're seeing other players emerge, you know, just yesterday, I did a webinar with Department of Energy, who, who uh, is, you know, kind of tongue in cheek wants to rename themselves the Department of Exploration, and they want to play a greater role on, on um, nuclear propulsion systems and uh, for um, space exploration and, and for for moon settlements on how you can greatly use uh, nuclear power. So, you know, we're seeing more and more players where traditionally it was NASA and department and the FAA. Now, I, I, we really, I mean, with the international agreements that we're, we're facing, you have State Department issues, you have the Federal Communication, uh, you know, Commission, uh, when we're dealing with the satellites and, and deorbiting of these satellites and who has you know, control over that. So it's, it's becoming more and more uh, a, a whole of government approach on, on legislating and, and, uh, and the rulemaking. So it's interesting. So I'll close with um, what is, as I'm, again, as I'm speaking to students that, you know, at some point we'll, we'll graduate with a degree in uh, aerospace engineering or some form of engineering degree, what does the future hold? Um, you say, I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't say with, with a great deal of certainty, but I know that human capital is still uh, remains king, um, that the industry is going to continue to need more and more engineers. Um, and the opportunities that I think have been paved um, for the, you know, for entrepreneurs and for young engineers that want to get in the business, it's it, it went from a, a path to a, a, a five-lane highway. I think of you know back to you know one of the earlier 
uh, employees of, of CSF, uh, I mentioned John Gedmark, he formed a, a small sack company called Astronis. That opportunity probably would not have been available to him and that access to capital would not have been available to him with not for the advancements that we have made in reducing the cost to access to space. It used to be when you wanted to launch something from space and certainly from the government's perspective, you had a government payload, they would go to the traditional launch providers and say, uh, you know, how much is this gonna cost me? And, and often the, the providers would say, well, how much do you have? And that's how the prices were set. Now the, the prices on launches, you know, with, with the advent you know, of, of SpaceX and, and their um, ability to um, have multiple payloads um, and then with the rocket lab for the smaller payloads, the, act, the, the cost of space comes down. And that means you can put that money that you ordinarily would spend on transportation, you put it back in the product on the ground. And that is gonna be a really game changer. Um, so, so no longer will innovation be stymied by the cost of, of access to space. Um, and you know, with ride shares and everything else that we're seeing, um, more and more opportunities are presenting itself for, for young uh, entrepreneurs and any entrepreneurs, I should say, that want to get involved with this industry. And, and I'm quite certain that these uh, new businesses and these new ventures and the innovation um, will most certainly be led by Purdue engineers. Um, so with that, I am happy. I hope I didn't run on too long and I hope I didn't put anyone to sleep or too many people to sleep, but uh, I'll conclude there, but I am open for questions. And I see in the, in the, the chat room there are some questions, and I, I don't know if I'm competent enough to do both, uh, read and talk. So, Bill, if you if you could cherry pick some of the questions, and I'm going to take a sip of my uh, my cold coffee, real. Yeah, quick. No, no, I'll do that. Thank you very much, Eric. And so, for people who are listening and may not have caught on, uh, in the WebEx event here, there's a separate Q and A box, and so feel free to type in a question there. I wrote a couple of myself. That I'm going to ask you, Eric, to give the students a chance to add their questions, and I'll start going down the list. We've already got several, but. You kind of hinted at this at the very end of your talk here. You know, there's a, there's this sort of joke that if you want to make a small fortune in the space business, you just start with a large one. Yeah. And, and and so, you know, but it sounds like a combination of technology policy and the business case have made the access to space change here. Which do you think is is the long pole in the tent still? Do we still need more work on the technology to make it cheaper? More work on the policy, or do we need a stronger business case? You know, it's, that's a great question. I, I've seen a lot of change in the, um, in the past maybe decade or half decade. One is there's, there continues to be record number, uh, record numbers of, of private sector um, venture investment. Um, a lot of this capital that's coming in is coming from the private sector. The, the, the FOMO, the fear of missing out, the, the, the idea that you want to be that next, you know, space billionaire. Um, and, and we're seeing that, you know, you're seeing these companies are having exit plans as well. You know, the, the great news about Virgin uh, going public and companies like uh, Voyager Space Holdings, which is, you know, uh, doing a lot of acquisitions and, you know, various uh, companies. And, and there's others out there. I think Redwire is another one. So the money is there. Um, I think the talent is is there. And I think we're trying our best to keep up with the policy. And that may be the, 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 challenge, the most challenging thing um, because industry doesn't work at the same speed as government. And that's not a knock on government. Um, I think the, you know, the federal agencies that we work with are better than they've ever been in the history of government. You know, they, they're really sharp people that are working there. They understand our, our industry better and they, they truly want to help. I see this firsthand with the, the Office of Space um, uh, commercial uh, Office of Commercial Space um, Transportation over, over at FAA, uh, AST. I see it at the Commerce Department. I see it at NASA. Certainly with this administrator, Administrator Brian Stein, really wants to help the commercial sector out. But it, it, again, it's not at the same pace. And, and because I think uh, sometimes investors and entrepreneurs have unrealistic expectations too. They, they want it now um, uh, and they, they want it yesterday. So... So there is a balance, um, but it is, you know, the progress that we're seeing, the, the startups, 
you know, I think it's no longer the case, you know, the, the, as you say, kind of the restaurant owner, the space owner, that if you want to make make a million dollars, start with a billion dollars. Um, I think some some um, some big names have paved the way on that, and it's opening up the the playing field for many others. Great. So you hinted on this. This is a student question. I think you hinted on this a little bit in your talk. You your quote was something to the effect that that in the space never seemed to make the top ten priorities in in the, in the you know halls of government down the street from you. And the question was, how do you explain to someone who's not interested in space flight or you know not an aerospace engineer like your audience is today, what's the argument against why worry about space when we have so many problems here on Earth? That's a, that's a long standing question, but, but how do you think about that question and how, how would you address it? Well, you certainly have to shape it to your audience. Uh, and when someone says that, you know, we're not getting uh, value out of space. Well, you, you look at the obvious, you look at um, uh, your navigation system that you count on every day that I've become completely dependent on just to, you know, shave five minutes off my commute, you know, going to ways that's space based technology. The, eight, the financial systems that we run on, you know, that's space-based technologies. But, you know, put it in the right here, right now, as we're talking uh, virtually, how are we doing this? Because of broadband, you know, satellite communications. I'm looking, uh, I'm gonna turn this around, I hope of not screwing anything up. I'll, I'll show you, hopefully you can see it on, on my wall here. Um, it's a picture from Planet, uh, a remote sensing image. Uh, it's of DC, the four seasons of DC. Um, uh, that's critical. That's critical. You know, when you look at um, refugees that are that are migrating into um, uh, these camps, you know, UN camps. Where are the water sources? And when you see in real time the the impact that these refugees are having at these camps, that appeals to people. From a strategic perspective, um, the DoD. Is not paying the type of uh, money that they're paying when they had exclusively only one vendor they could go to for imagery or you know um, satellite communications, uh, and you see it in the advancements of our technology. So you you have to make the case, and I think now during COVID, we're making the case more and more of the, the how we are surviving, how teachers are teaching these classes. It is it would not happen without space based technology. Um, and tracking, um, what are they, contact tracing or whatever are they? That's, that's through, you know, the data from phones and things of that nature, again, through, through space. So you have to make that, um, you have to bring it down to earth to members of Congress. There's still people, I will tell you, there was a member of Congress in a very senior leadership position that the day that the commercial crew vehicle, SpaceX's Dragon splashed down, and the astronauts, after spending what two months in space, um, at a fraction of the cost that we were paying, was still complaining that, and and still not seeing the value of commercial space, and still thinking that NASA needs to uh, own this technology, and the commercial sector shouldn't be providing these services. This is a senior member of Congress saying this stuff. So there's a lot of a lot of education that needs to happen. So one of the other questions, kind of, let me see if I can take a couple and kind of pack them together here into one. So, you know, you talked about access to ISS with the commercial crew. So that's, that's a science-based mission, but commercially provided. You know, Starlink is an is a example of commercial communications ops. You mentioned the planet in the picture you showed with the remote sensing. There's been the history of like direct TV operators, right? They've been around for a long time as, as commercial space entities, not necessarily access, but Tourism, right, or the uh, sort of adventure, leisure adventure, if you want to call it that. The, the Virgin Galactic is an example of that. What balance, oh, and then also mentioned here, things like fiber optics printing, some, some low gravity, zero gravity manufacturing. Where do you see the, the, the things leading the charge here? What's, what's the balance going forward? Can you, can you prognosticate on that? What's going to be the big deal next? Well, it's, it's really all of the above. Um, it, it was so satisfying for me to see the success of a company like made in space i actually knew these guys the founders some of the founders when they were still students in college and they came out with this idea you know uh, of developing a 3d printer in space um how did they first test that through suborbital uh flights you know to see whether you know the different principles would work 
then eventually they, they got their Frankenstein looking 3D printer on the International Space Station. And you know, one day NASA said, hey, we need a wrench, um, send it up on the next mission. And they said, well, hey, we can, we can just send it up on, you know, with a 3D printer. That is a building block. That's a stepping stone to building civilizations. If you can build in space, if you can build the basic, you know, fundamental things in space, some of your tools, some of the hardware that you need, fiber optics, which, you know, I think they, they will um, be able to monetize that and capitalize on that. Then you, you start, you know, that, that greater Leo economy, um, the research that's going on in space. You know, again, Stephen can tell you about some of the, the fantastic research that has is, is happened on the ISS, you know, on, on uh, um, growing food and, and the medical research. I often think to myself, and this is um, part of my, my bias, that if they could develop a, a golf ball that could go about 15 yards longer, that would be one of the biggest sellers in the world. You know, space-based technology, you know, golf balls that travel further, as long as they're, they're legal by the, the PGA, um, you know, things like that. When you bring it, each thing that we develop is slowly and surely, you know, coming, you know, bringing these services down to earth, Tempur-Pedic mattresses, you know, and, and everyone knows about Velcro and Teflon and all those other, you know, things that the space program has brought. But, but it, it's, it's going to be the economy and, and, and tourism, space tourism is really right at the forefront and, and right at the cusp too. I, I just had a great talk with uh, yesterday with George Whiteside, who literally just stepped down as the CEO of um, Virgin Galactic. Um, and he's now the, uh, the chief space officer, which is about the be you know, one of the best titles you can have um, besides president of CSF. Um, and, and, and they're going to be launching passengers, you know, imminently, I, I think probably within, you know, four or five months. Um, and, and what that's going to mean, that interest that, that's going to that's gonna bring to people, um, it's going to bring the cost down, too. And, and it's going to make things more accessible. So people that have this idea and say, I wonder if this would work in space, or if I wonder if this could you know, benefit you know, society. It's going to be those, you know, those people that have that access. And, and those, you know, the folks that have that access early on are going to you know, create that access for us later down the line. I, I, I use the, the analogy of when, you know, um, flat screen TVs first came out, they were like $15,000 for a 40 inch, you know, thick flat screen TV, if you will, the big plasma ones. Now you can get that at, you know, you know, Best Buy for about $179. I mean, just look at the, the rate that, that those prices have come down. I, I see the, the frequency and the routine cadence of, of travelers going to space bringing the cost down and, and making it more accessible to people. I think, I think you're muted. You're, you're right. I am. I'm sorry. I got it. <laughs> I only knew because I couldn't hear you. Yeah, I got it. Sorry. Well, I, I didn't know. Thank you. <laughs> so what will the commercial space program bring for international students? We have a pretty decent number of international students in our undergraduate program, in our graduate program. And, and do you think commercial space will provide an opportunity for more internationals to work in the business? Well, and, and where does that intersect with, you know, ITAR and ER and those things? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I'll be really candid with you. This is, um, this is a major pet peeve of mine. And this is something that I've tried to work and I haven't got as much traction as, as I wish. Um, and certainly the, the, uh, the situation with COVID has not helped. I think it's a national embarrassment that we bring over uh, students from all around the world. We educate them in the finest universities like Purdue or Stanford or RPI. And then we give them a diploma and then we give them a ticket back home and, and make them fight for this visa, you know, to stay in the country, a country that I think the vast majority of them would like to stay in a country that, you know, for companies, that I'm, I'm guaranteeing you many of those foreign engineers that you're educating would love to work at SpaceX or Blue Origin. And we have made it so burdensome, you know, with the immigration laws that we have um, and the visa requirements uh, and the ITAR restrictions that a lot of these companies, if they're doing work, any kind of work with the DOD, you know, they face these incredibly stringent ITAR requirements. 
And I think that's awful. So we're going to educate, give, give people the best education and then send them back to China so they can help develop the, the Chinese space program as opposed to, hey, I'd like to stay here and, you know, start my career like millions and millions of other Americans have done through the immigration process. So one, because of this, the absurdity of our, our um, immigration policy, sorry, that, and this is not a Democratic or Republican issue. This has been broken for many, um, many administrations. Um, but because of that, we are sending people back to their country, back to France or India or Luxembourg or wherever, and they're starting their own um, uh, commercial space companies. And they're seeing what, what's happening in the US and it's gaining in steam. And I'm not against that. I, I work with, uh, I've worked with the UAE, I work with the, all the ESA companies in Japan and, and all those companies, countries, and I love what they're doing. And I love the partnerships that are developing and the relate and these partnerships are developing because of relationships. Um, and, and they see the talent. I, I see there's a company, iSpace, in Japan that is working closely with, um, I believe, Draper Labs um, on developing a, a lunar vehicle. Um, but I, I think if, if we look at it from a, a national perspective, we should want to keep the best talent that we could. Let's be selfish on that issue. If we can't, let, let's work with these, these, um, uh, these foreigners that you know, have these ideas, these, have these companies and partner uh, the best way we can. And I think we have a lot of work to do, but, um, but I think I, it's great that they're, they're studying at Purdue and, and I think the, the friendships and, and that they'll have there will transcend, you know, the, um, it's becoming such a global, you know, um, industry anyways. I, I think it'll start transcending the, the, the boundary lines. Well, like, like you said, one of, the, one of the things we're doing today is because of satellite communications, for instance. And so aerospace does make the world smaller. I talk about that a lot. So maybe in the near term here, it's gonna be harder for international students to get a job in the US, but that's gonna change. And maybe the job they've got back in their country of origin will end up being working with us anyway. Absolutely. And like I said, I see it with the UAE. A friend of mine was the, um, the space attache here um, for many years. He went back to the UAE. Um, we helped them you know, write the UAE's um, national space policy. And as they're developing, and they're, and they're a very progressive, um, you know, a Middle Eastern country uh, evidence with their, their peace treaty recently with um, Israel. And, and they have a, this growing space program that's trying to be inclusive of all their citizens. And I, am, I really applaud the work they're doing and so many other countries, I, too many to list. So one of the things that, that, that's come up a couple of places is, is uh, you know, companies like Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, right, are, have, have a space tourism part of their business. And that seems like, well, okay, that's rides for rich guys or rich men and women, right? Rich people. How, how much of that are they getting government subsidy for? We always hear that. You're one of the people that probably knows the answer to that. Well, you know, um, subsidies tend, I tend to think that can be an ugly word sometimes. If, if it's you know, referred, you know, if it's my companies, if somebody other companies, then maybe it applies. <laughs> um, listen, you know, um, Virgin and Blue have received government money. Um, but they get a service for that. You know, that's an investment that the government makes in there, whether it's a, a NASA payload that is being flown, you know, on one of the experimental flights for, for microgravity research. That's a service and, and they're paid for it. Um, and so the government benefits from that. It's not, you know, just these, these willy nil, nilly handouts. And, um, and I can assure you that many, if there were these handouts, many, you know, many others would, would point them out. Um, ha has the government invested in companies? Uh, you know, there's just always this argument, how much has the government invested in SpaceX? I don't know what the number is, but I know certainly the government has made investments in SpaceX. Has that paid off for the government? Absolutely. Though, and, and, and I won't just single out SpaceX, but, you know, on the commercial cargo and the commercial uh, crew program, that was this public-private partnership that, you know, the government, you know, engaged in with the private sector. By doing commercial crew and cargo the way they did, it has saved the taxpayers close to, I think, over $20 billion in development cost. If they did it, yeah, you know, and this is not an, an Eric, you know, number. This is this was put out by the GAO. If they were to do that, do it, the, um, the government was to contract by traditional means like they've done in the past. 
it would have cost over $20 billion more. And, and when, when you say 20 billion, then you're also adding five, 10 years more to the, to the life of the project. So this is just, I see much more efficiency in partnering with um, these commercial companies. And you know something, sometimes the government makes investments in companies and it doesn't work out. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, the, the rule of thumb and the government has a much better track record, I can tell you, than the venture community where they'll look at um, 10 companies, you know, they'll, they'll invest in 10 companies and it'll be a big success if one of them makes it. The government's a little more prudent, a lot more prudent with the, with the taxpayer dollars on that. And I, and I think it has really paid off. It's pr paid off in the flight opportunities program and crew, cargo, um, you know, work that's being done on the space station. So it's, it's really whatever amount of money um, and you know, fractional amount of money that was, it, it is a great investment made by the government. So Eric, let me ask you real quick. It's, it's coming up on noon here on my computer clock. Do you have a few more minutes? We have a few more questions. Okay, let's, Purdue? So, are you kidding me? <laughs> so if the students need to leave to go to class or something, there's a few classes that are still in person and synchronous. They can, they, you feel free to sneak out if you need to do that. But I'll, we'll stay with Eric for a few more minutes and ask a couple more questions. Um, there's one in here, actually a couple, I think, kind of hinted on this. And even with my more aviation background, knowing about airspace and things, they're asking a little bit about how do they plan to, to you know, avoid undermining each other's operations. How do you get this cadence of operation and, and have the airspace integration as opposed to prioritization? What, do, what are some of the things that need to be done there? Well, one thing that I learned is the tools that the, the government is using right now for the getting the NAS, the, na the national airspace, they're, they're really outdated. Um, and the, the name of the system that they're developing escapes me right now. Talked about it for a year, but they're they're trying to develop this system of you know this airspace integration. So you have this this total common operating picture, you know, from all aspects, you know, from from the ground to uh, you know 220 miles up. Um, and when I went out to the, um, the the FAA facility to see that. I'm like, well, that looks good. You know, it looked like some of the, the software that, you know, my old company used uh, AGI on tracking objects in space. And, uh, and I said, well, when do you, th you think this program will be operational? And they said, you know, we, we think about um, 10 years. And I was like, 10, 10 years? Are, are, are you kidding me? Um, and it's, it's not the engineer's fault. It's just the way that the procurement system works. It's the funding that, you know, so much of... Um, well, you see the, the fights uh, on our federal budget and, and how, you know, Congress spends spends the money and and who is advocating for, you know, software for the national air, air system. And then I, I think also the, the history that um, the next gen has had, maybe not the, the best history of, of transitioning for the national air traffic controllers on the software that they're using and, and the system. Next gen has been it's been taking almost 20 years to implement. So, you know, Congress doesn't always get a warm and fuzzy when, you know, government agencies ask for more money for these software programs. One of the things that we were, you know, um, excited about with, with the, the NAPA study, this uh, uh, on space traffic management is a reliance and a utilization of existing commercial technologies. Why, why go out and develop a, a program and a system, you know, brand new, reinventing the wheel when, you have the 90% solution right here. And with a minor, you know, modification, you'll have a hundred percent solution. And sometimes that solution exceeds, you know, even the, the, the requirements that, that, that the government needs. So, you know, it's, it's funding, it's requirements, it's making clear what the priorities are. And fortunately, I, I would say, you know, with, um, the, with the administration, they have seen a lot of these space, requirements as um, as critical as critical infrastructure and again creeping back into those top 10 priorities that um, you know we don't have to compete with guns and abortion and and all the other you know issues that kind of rise to the top every election year um, although this year we have a lot of issues that are rising to the top so um, my goal is you know whoever if um, if by if 
there's a Biden administration um, that they keep the Space Council. I think that's uh, critical. I think that puts the space in the na on the national forefront. Um, and I, I believe they would. The, all the people that I talked to with the Biden campaign seem very um, enthusiastic about this, the Space Council and see the need for it. And there's, yeah, there's a question related to that, 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 that we see changes so often in the, you know, every four years or every eight years in the White House, the turnover in, the, in Congress. And, and, and so how does that cycle you know, affect things? Are there, are there sometimes concerns that, well, oh, boy, stuff's not going to get done this year or? Yeah, um, it's a challenge. Uh, and it's why Washington has so many lobbyists, you know, because, uh, you know, everyone's willing to help try to navigate these these new waters and new relationships that come out. And, you know, I don't know, I think 15 percent of the Congress will change, you know, in November. So that, that think of all those new offices that you have to educate um, and get them up to speed because they might be coming from. Oklahoma or Nebraska, and they care about agriculture and water issues, um, and they really don't care about space issues. But you know, how do you, you know, but they might be put on the science committee and, you know, have control over the NASA authorization bill. So it's a constant educational process. Um, and, and we're going to see a challenge. And again, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but if something changes with the administration, you know, one of the, the big uh, issues that this administration has has pushed has been uh, return to the moon and the Artemis program uh, for sp space related issues. And, you know, is a new uh, you know, president going to make this the same level of priority that you know, the current administration has made this? Because some of the Democrats in, in uh, the House have said, you know, 2024 isn't realistic. Maybe we shoot for 2027. And, you know, would the Biden administration say, yeah, I think that's more realistic, or that's a tremendous waste of money. You know, that's that's uh, you know, seven billion dollars out of the NASA budget. Um, so you know, those are arguments that we're going to have to be ready um, to make. You know, um, not come November, but you know, when if if and when there there's change, and that and that's constant. You know, the Obama administration was different from the Trump administration, and and the same goes for the Bush and Clinton years. So there's always a transition. Fortunately, there's a lot of retreads and, you know, the folks that were in the Obama administration are probably, you know, going to be in the Biden administration. So it's uh, less of an education there. If, the, you know, again, all speculative. Sure, sure. We all, yeah, we have to wait a little bit to see. Put that caveat out there. Yeah. So there's a couple, couple questions I'm trying to, trying to, maybe I think I can put them together into one sort of topic here. Talking about, and you mentioned Artemis, for instance, but return to the moon or people to Mars. So, you know, that's a huge, typically it's been a national level investment to do that kind of thing. But we have companies talking about that, right? Both Blue Origin and, and SpaceX both have parts of their mission statement essentially saying we want people in space. So, you know, where is that role in the commercial industry? And, and how crucial is the commercial industry to making those things happen? And, and maybe even just what you said, could, could we get to a point where the commercial industry could decouple from the government investment? To do those kinds of return to those giant leaps, I guess. Yeah, you know, I I don't know if I said this la too loudly or you know publicly. I don't think it's far fetched that the first humans to Mars may not be there uh, from NASA. You know, they they could you know the first you know humans on Mars could come from a commercial company. Now, if you said that. Five years ago, 10 years ago, you'd be laughed out of the room. I think it's really realistic right now. You have, and certainly, you know, we, we know the names of two, you know, uh, very large enthusiastic uh, benefactors, you know, of the space program that, that see this as the end goal, you know, whether, you know, communities living and working in space for one and, you know, the exploration um, uh, and development, you know, of Mars, you know, another one sees it that way. Um, and they, they've had some very audacious goals, audacious goals, but, um, they've kind of backed up a lot of what they said and they, and they've put their money where their mouth is. Um, and I, I just don't think it's that far fetched. Now, could the government be a customer? Absolutely. Um, could the government be a partner more than likely, but I, I think, um, I think the progress won't be slowed down in exploration 
by the pace of the government. And, and, and the government knows that. You know, if, if NASA is a lead agency, they know they have to you know, work with, you know, um, with these partners. Uh, something interesting today, this was in Politico space, and I was really surprised by this, and maybe even caught off guard. Um, Charlie Bolden, the former NASA administrator, you know, and speculating what a, a, um, a future Biden administration may look like, a space for, for space, he said, you know, I, th I don't want to misquote him, but something to the effect that SLS may not be, you know, um, in, you know, existent, you know, in the next, it may be cut in the, the Biden administration, it may be cut in the Trump administration. This is, this was kind of the linchpin of, you know, NASA's exploration systems. And it's becoming almost, you know, not by fault of their own, or maybe it depends how you assess the blame, but, you know, as the commercial sector it, it may, is leapfrogging it, you know, you have a, a heavy launch vehicle with the SpaceX, you, you know, Blue is developing a heavy launch vehicle. If they, they get to market before SLS, you know, it doesn't make, makes SLS less viable, I guess. But, you know, to hear the NASA administrator say that was, um, I don't know. It, it, it was surprising. I, I, don't, I don't think I should be shocked, but, um, you know, he was one of the advocates, you know, for SLS. So what's the space policy issue that you care a lot about, even if it's not maybe a top one for CSF or, or one of the, is there something that you've got like that's, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for CSF, but, but it'd be really cool or really neat, or I'd really like to see this happen. That's one of the questions from a student. I tell you what I have found to be, very, very rewarding in my job. And I'm dating myself because of the virus, but I used to get out and see all the different companies. And I used to be able to, you know, pre COVID walk the factory line. I saw SpaceX when their factory was, was like almost empty, you know, and, and they were just building a, you know, a few rocks. Now it's, it's just filled with, they have a, an area where um, they're building the dragons and they call it the dragon nursery. You know, because they have all these, you know, uh, dragons in, in assembly or rocket lab when you see them, um, you know, the, 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 the rockets laid out or going to planet, you know, I, I, I knew planet when they were in two, two offices ago or two you know, buildings and, and how they've grown and developed and to know that and, and the list goes on, as I said you know, earlier about made in space and, um, and so many of these companies, many of our companies did not exist 10 years ago. That's a remark. We're the largest association really for, well, for commercial space, but we've, I think, become the largest space, you know, trade association. Um, and, and this is made up of companies that just weren't, some of these people were still in school 10 years ago. Um, you know, a relativity, you know, building rockets using three, you know, additive manufacturing and, you know, buying the world's largest, building the world's largest uh, 3D printer. Um, that kind of stuff excites me. And to know that, and again, I'm not an engineer. I would break things. I've touched, you know, space ready hardware. I've got um, admonished for that. They've, they've put red lines in when I go on tours, um, maybe because I'm so excitable, I'm like a child. Um, but knowing that those, 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 that hardware that I see that I've touched, um, uh, that it's flying in space and it's, and, and what it's providing and that, knowing that if, if, if we are able to help get some funding, you know, to help develop that program and then NASA or the Department of Defense or the intelligence community is benefiting from that, it's really rewarding. And that's, that's what excites me about this job. So there's one, one more, it may be somebody fishing for a job specifically, but that's okay. If you're interested, we'll call out later. But a question asking if, if you have a financial analytics branch, like it's basically somebody doing the business case for CSF, or maybe advising the National Space Council to kind of show here's the potential payoff, here's the, you know, profit, risk benefit kind of ideas. So, you know, the one thing you'll find as vast as space is, you know, when it comes to space policy and, you know, the people that are doing the, uh, the DC space community is, is rather small. Um, so we have a lot of friends in the industry that are doing that one. You know, I think if you're looking for good reports uh, on that type of stuff, like startup space and what the global space economy looks like, what the launch industry looks like, forecast reports, I, I think one of the best in the business is uh, Bryce 
Space and Technologies led by uh, Carissa Christensen. Um, and we get a lot of our analytics from them. Um, there's a group up in New York. It used to be called the Space Angels Network. Now I believe they're called, it's called Space Capital. Um, but it's Chad Anderson's group up in New York and, and they do great work. And then they actually just, if they're fishing for a job, um, he just released a website called Space Talent. And it's, a, it's like a clearinghouse for sort of the new space jobs. Um, I'll, I, I don't have the, the, the web address. I think it's spacetalent.com. Space talent but, um, but, but Chad does great reports, these quarterly reports on the investment, uh, the commercial investment, pri private sector investment, rather, uh, in, the, in the space industry and, and where that money's coming from. So between those two, um, I go to a lot. Um, Tom, uh, DOT has, the government has some, some good um, products, but a lot of times those are done by contractors. So those are the two that come to mind that are just, you know, really a great um, snapshot of, of where the, the numbers of the industry and then where the industry is going. And I think there's something called the Space Report out there that kind of touches on the $400 billion uh, space economy and how, uh, how they came up with those numbers. Great. Well, so Eric, thank you so much. I know the students have been asking questions. I think I managed to hit all the all the questions, at least in part. So if, if a student doesn't feel like he or she was represented today, I apologize. That's my fault uh, on not getting the questions. But Eric, thank you so much. I know we can't applaud for you. I will applaud here in my office. It's, it's right, okay. one, one person it. clapping, but can, <laughs> can certainly thank you very much. Thanks for being part of our 75th anniversary celebration and providing us with the view of commercial space that most of us as engineers don't have, and that's one of the reasons we wanted you to do this, give us that extra aspect. So thank you very much for helping us out today. Well, thank you, uh, Bill. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the work that, that Purdue has done over, you know, since its inception, but more selfishly over the last 75 years uh, to help my job um, be a little easier. And, and the talent pool that you guys have provided and, and continue to provide, uh, it really is the, the next generation of, of leaders in, in the space industry. And I, I look forward to meeting as, as many as possible. And like, like I said, not a day goes by that I'm not somehow impacted, affected, or touched by a, a Purdue uh, alumni. So, uh, so you're doing great work there. You're doing the Lord's work in space. Uh, and I appreciate that. And happy to help you guys out um, in the Purdue community any anytime you guys want. Great. And thank you very much, Eric. Have a good afternoon. And to all the students and, and alumni and friends of the school watching today, thank you for participating as well. And we'll have a few more 75th anniversary celebrations coming up. We've actually got a plan to have a panel of former heads of the school that are able to participate. We'll be doing that. I think it's on October 1st. So we'll push out some more information about that. That's maybe a little bit more parochial, but you'd be welcome to listen in if you want, Eric, well, talking about it. the history of the school. So Should thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.